We're going to go back to our study today on the book of Hebrews, so I need you to turn to chapter 1, if you would, and while you're doing that, let me remind you of a very important factor that is dominant throughout the entire book. Jesus is better. Say that with me. Jesus is better. That means he's better than the old covenant. That means he's better than the old sacrifices. He's better than the old law. He's better than the old ways of worship. Jesus is better. All right, Hebrews chapter 1, starting with verse 1 this morning. And we're going to read the first three verses as we begin. In the past, Jesus spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of of the majesty in heaven. Now I hope you notice three very obvious declarations in these verses. The writer is declaring without question that Jesus is far and above superior to everyone and everything and he works in ways that are supernatural. Now this is important to note, beloved, because man is incapable of reaching beyond the natural world. In fact, if it were not for a very simple truth stated in verse 1, we could never know God. But in verse 1, we have two powerful words. God spoke. Think about it. If God had never spoken, we would never know if he was really there. See, here's our problem. Man is stuck in this natural box. And it contains him with the boundaries of time and space. And everything outside of that box is supernatural. And something deep in the heart and the mind of every living being is a belief that something, someone is out there. So somebody got the bright idea. We need to find a way to get outside of the box. We need to explore the supernatural. And these explorations, almost without fail, birth some kind of religion. Some kind of a belief structure that will encourage you to attempt to breach the walls of your box. Try to cut some kind of exit into it so that we can at least catch a glimpse of what's out there. You need a couple of examples? Well, here's what has resulted from man's search. Buddhism. Buddhism says that once you have worked and thought and processed your way into nirvana, you've made it out of the box. Islam basically says the same thing. They just use different methods. And this is the case with any world religion you want to put on the list. Shintoism, Hinduism, Confucius, they're all basically the same. It's a man's attempt to find his way to God. Let's escape the natural and arrive at the supernatural. There's one big problem with this. You want to guess what it is? Man can't do it. Man can't escape the natural to reach the supernatural. Man can't leave the natural to reach the supernatural any more than I could walk into a phone booth and come out of it Superman. The truth is, what are you laughing about? 
The truth is, there's only one way for man to experience the supernatural. The supernatural has to come to him. That's why these two words are so powerful. God spoke. These two words are, are promising. They're redemptive. They're, they're enlightening. God spoke. The supernatural came to the natural. God reached out to us. And if we are privileged to know anything about God, it will not be by us escaping the natural boundaries or changing the way we think or working our way up to Him. It is only going to happen by Him coming to us. Now do you understand why these words are so important? God spoke. And He went beyond that. He became a man and he crawled into the box with us. He left the supernatural and became natural man. Now do you see why the Christian faith is so different from all of the religions of the world? The message of Christianity is this. Luke 19 and 10. For the Son of Man came... To seek and save those who were lost. God stepped into the box as a man. Jesus Christ. That's why it's so foolish and is so futile for people to say, it really doesn't matter what you believe or what religion you embrace because all roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. Every other road outside of the narrow road that Jesus spoke of, on every one of those roads, beloved, the bridge is out. So listen carefully. The living God that we serve is not detached from us. You know, the deists, I guess there's still some around, they teach that God created everything and then he just kind of, kind of abandoned it to its own courses. But beloved, God is not that impersonal. He is not silent. God speaks. I mean, look at it this look at, look at the Look at the ways he has spoken to us. Go back to verse 1. It says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. God has spoken many times in many ways. Did you know he speaks through the books of the Old Testament? All 39 of them. All throughout those books, you find God speaking through visions or through parables or through different types and symbols. But regardless of what manner God that it's recorded, it's all God speaking to us. In other words, God used men through the ages, men under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, and every word that they wrote down was the Word of God, and it was God who determined what they should record. A lot of the Old Testament is written in a narrative form. It's a story. It's history. A lot of it is, is poetry. Some of it is strictly prophecy. And when the writer of Hebrews says that God spoke in various ways, he is referring to the overall content of the Old Testament. Because some of it is law. Some of it is doctrine. Some of it is ethics. Some of it is moral teaching. Some of it is a warning. Some of it are words of encouragement. But through all of it and in all of it, it is God speaking to us. I want to ask you to try something. If you've never done this, if you've ever, maybe never thought about it, when you sit down, and I hope and pray you do, when you sit down to read this word. Before you even open it, simply pray, God, speak to me today. 
through your word. And then, as you begin to read, just listen. Listen to him. Open your ears and your heart. And let me say one more thing about the opening of verse 1. He used these four words, in these last days. Beloved, there is a lot of erroneous teaching today about the last days. The airways were filled a little over a week ago with all these doomsday preachers talking about the coming eclipse and that when the sun was blotted out and the planets all aligned themselves, we could look forward to the coming rapture of the church. Well, if they were right, a whole lot of people missed it. The last days. Now, I'm up here. Listen, 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 listen. The last days are not going to be predicated by some cataclysmic event in the heavens. And it's not something for us to anticipate to be yet out in the future. To put it simply, we have been in the last days since Jesus ascended back to heaven and took his place at the right hand of the Father. So take note of how the writer of Hebrews said it. He got it right. He said, in these last days. He knew he was in them. We were in them then. He acknowledged them, and we've been in them ever since. So when you hear people preaching about the coming last days, tell them to read the Bible, because it's plain and simple. We have been in the last days since Jesus returned to the Father. That, that, that's good preaching. I don't care if it did say it. So the last days are days of fulfillment. In the Old Testament, the Jews saw the last days as a time when all the promises of God would be fully realized. The Messiah was going to come. The kingdom of God would be established. Salvation would be the rule of law. And Israel would no longer be in bondage. But you know, by the time Jesus came, this was interpreted more as political than spiritual. They were more interested in getting out from under the thumb of Rome than establishing the kingdom of God. So when Jesus arrived and he began his public ministry, he indeed, he began to fulfill every promise of God and he was declaring God's kingdom not as the result of some future conflict, but it was coming through and by his son. It was here. But in these last days, the writer said, He has spoken to us by His Son. So that means Jesus is the revelation of God. He was more than just a man. He was God in the flesh. He was and He is the final revelation of God in whom all of God's promises are fulfilled. Now in verses 2 and 3, there are seven declarations regarding the excellence of Jesus Christ. There is no way I can give you all seven of those by the time you expect to go home. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you two of them today. And I'll give you the other five next Sunday. So if you want to know what all seven of them are, you fill in the blank. You've got to come back next week. But let's focus on the first two. To begin with, he is an excellent heir. Look at this. He says, In those last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir to all things. Beloved, if Jesus is the Son of God, then he is the heir to all that God possesses. Psalm 2, verses 7 and 8 says, He said to me, this is 
this is this is Jesus I believe speaking he said to me you are my son today I've become your father ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance the ends of the earth your possession the Apostle Paul wrote that all things were not only created by Christ but they were created for him Colossians 1 and verse 16 for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, and get this, and for him. That says that everything that exists is for him. It's for his glory. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5 for a second. Look at the first verse of the chapter. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So I want you to get this picture in your head. God is sitting on the throne of heaven in all of his, all of his majesty. He's holding in his hand a scroll. Now that scroll is the title deed to the earth and everything in it. This is the deed to be passed down to the heir. To the one who has the right to claim everything in the earth. You know, in the era of the New Testament, Roman law required that a last will and testament be sealed seven times to safeguard it from tampering. And so what they would do is they would take this, this long parchment and they would begin to roll it up and they would roll it to a certain point and they would put a seal on it. And they would roll it over that and, and it, you see what it would do. The hot wax would hold it together. Well, they would keep rolling, and they'd roll a little more. They'd put another seal, glue it together. And they would repeat this process until they had sealed the scroll seven times. And those seals were not to be broken until the person whose will it was had been passed down to the air. Now, Revelation chapter 5, picking up at verse 2. Remember, God is sitting on his throne. He's holding the scroll in his hand. And I saw an, a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because... No one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. Who is he talking about? All right. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Beloved, the lamb, the son of God, took the scroll because he and he alone had a right to take it. He is the only one who has the right to open it because he is the heir of all the earth. Now here's a tragedy. Even though Christ is the heir of everything God possesses, even though he has offered to share his inheritance with anyone and everyone who will trust in him. Even so, 
Many still reject him. Many rejected God as he revealed himself in the Old Testament. And although God has perfectly revealed himself in the New Testament through his Son, people still reject him. Jesus even told a parable to try to illustrate this travesty. Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to start reading at verse 33. This is Jesus speaking. He said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now this is the answer the Pharisees gave. Well, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And then he will rent the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Now, I don't know if this requires a whole lot of elaboration. To willfully, intentionally reject Jesus Christ is to face the eternal damnation of a just God. Now, to the people of Israel, this parable was judgment that declared that because of their blatant rejection of the prophets, because they had rejected and murdered the Son, the inheritance that had been set aside for them has been taken away and given to a new nation, a new spiritual Israel, the church. Because it's His to give. He is an excellent heir. He is also an excellent creator. From verse 2 it says, But in those last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. Now, let me add John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 to this. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Now look at this. Jesus Christ is the agent through whom God created all things. By the way, in Genesis chapter 1, when God said, let us, who do you think he's talking about? The Son and the Holy Spirit are there. The Trinity is present in the very beginning. Because it said, God said, let us, and then the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the water. So Christ Jesus is the agent through which God created. His ability to create, beloved, is one of the greatest proofs of His divinity. 
In fact, there were three things that validated his claim to be God in the flesh. His sinlessness, his complete righteousness, and his role in creation. Now, there's a word I want you to look at with me in, in this verse. It's the word, and this is from the NIV, the word universe. But the old, the King James Version uses the term worlds instead. Now, the common Greek word used for world is cosmos. But that's not the word the writer used here in Hebrews 1 and 2. Instead, he used the word, if I can pronounce this correctly, aeonus, which means the ages. This declares that Jesus is not only responsible for creating the physical earth, but he created time and space and energy and matter as well. Christ created everything in the whole universe and everything operating in it. And he did so without any effort. Here's one that'll kind of tickle you. Or blow your mind, one or the other. Sir John Nichols was a Nobel laureate in neurophysiology. And he was lecturing in Chicago in 1968. He said that the odds against the right combination of circumstances occurring to have evolved intelligent life on the earth, and that is for all that means for all the factors to perfectly align. He said, those odds are, now Kim, don't put this up yet. The odds are 400,000 trillion, 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 trillion to one. Let me give you, Kim, put that next slide up here, all right? Let's start with 400,000, okay? Okay. Trillion, 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 trillion is this. That is 400,000 followed by 18 zeros. So he declared it. And then being the good secular humanist scientist that he was, he said, but it'll probably never happen again. You want to you wanna know how the... You, try this sometime. Get you a paper bag and about two pounds worth of Swiss watch parts. You know, gears, spindles, watch bands, hands, faces, you know, the whole, the whole bit, and dump it all in that bag and start shaking it. How long are you going to have to shake that bag before a Rolex pops out? The odds are about the same. You know it'll never happen. Beloved, if you refuse to recognize the, that there is a divine creator, then you're going to have a difficult time trying to explain how this marvelous, complex, detailed universe came about. You know what the eclipse was last week? It was just a reminder of the glory and the majesty of the Creator. He made it all. There is, there is really no other logical explanation. But you've got millions of people, too many of them in academia, who somehow believe that eons ago, this component existing in this particular pool of goo and this protein which happened to be found in this river of slime somehow got together and they were subjected to just the right temperatures and just the right environmental influences and before you know it voila it stood up on two feet and said hey I'm a man Do you know this is the same man whose heart will beat 800 million times in a normal lifetime and pump enough blood to fill a string of tanker cars that would stretch from Boston to New York. This is the same man 
who has a tiny cubic half inch section of brain cells that records and stores a lifetime of memories. This is the same man who has a complex hearing system inside of his head that allows waves of air to hit this, this container of liquid which it somehow turns into heard sound. You're going to tell me all of this is a cosmic coincidence? I got news for you. You believe that? You got more faith than I do. Because you've got to have great faith to believe it just happened. You consider the vastness of the universe. I mean, let me, give you some, let me give you this for perspective. If you possibly could, inside of our sun, you could store 1.2 million Earths and still have room for 4.3 million of our moons. That's how big our sun is. Now, the sun is approximately 865,000 miles in diameter. It is 93 million miles away from us. In fact, the next closest star to us is Alpha Centauri, which, by the way, is five times bigger than our sun. But now we have a moon, and... It's just a short jaunt to the moon. It's only 211,463 miles. You could walk there in about 27 years. I mean, that's just a good stretch of the legs. A ray of light can travel at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. So that means a beam of light from your trusty Duracell flashlight can reach the moon in one and a half seconds. Now, let's say we could travel at the speed of light. It would still take you 2 minutes and 18 seconds to get to Venus, which is the closest planet to us. And if you wanted to go to Mercury, that would take you an hour and 11 seconds. But if we're going to speculate, let's really reach. Let's go to Pluto. 2.7 billion miles from the Earth. At the speed of light, it'll take you five and a half hours to get there. And once you get there, I want you to get this, once you got that far out into space, you're still not even out of our solar system. Now we navigate on this planet by using the North Star. You know the old sailors? That was how they kept their bearing. They would look for and focus on the North Star. Did you know that the North Star is 400 billion miles away from us? And at the speed of light, that's a 430-year trip. So think about this. The light that sailors were navigating by from the North Star, left its source of origin 430 years earlier. There are stars outside of our solar system that dwarf anything we would ever even know. Uh, there's a system called Betelgeuse, and astronomers have calculated that the principal star in this system is, are you ready for this? First of all, it's 880 quadrillion miles away from the Earth. I don't know how they exactly calculate that. You know, you look in the telescope and you say, man, that's way out there. But it's 880 quadrillion miles away, and it has a diameter. Are you ready? The diameter of this star alone is larger than the orbit of the Earth around our sun. The question is, where did all of this come from? 
Did it just happen? Or was it conceived in the mind of someone far greater? Who created it? It can't be by accident. It can't be because everything operates in such absolute precision. The way the earth rotates on its axis and then revolves around the sun. They have told us if the tilt of the earth were to get off one one hundredth of a degree, the whole planet would perish because we would lose our orbit and be cast out into deep space. Somebody had to create it. And the Bible declares that that maker is Jesus Christ. You know why I believe it? Because he's better. He's better. He's better than anything the world has to offer. He's better than any other God that is made up in the minds of men. He is greater than any power or force in all the universe. He is certainly greater than our adversary, the devil. He is better. And you can trust him. You can put your hope in him. You can believe in him. Because he's better than any other option you might find. Do you have your faith placed in Him wholly? Remember I told you last week that the writer in writing the book of Hebrews was addressing three groups of people. Believing Jews. Those who were intellectually convinced but had not committed. And those who just did not believe at all. Who didn't even know who Jesus was. I don't think there are any of those here. We've got a lot that are here that are in that fully committed group. The group I worry about and the group that I'm appealing to right now is have you intellectually cast your lot with Jesus but you have never fully committed your heart and your life to Him? Beloved, He's better. He's better. Father, I pray that you would help us in the closing moments of this morning to fully realize the wonder and the majesty of Jesus Christ. And I pray if there's one here who in their mind believes but has never in their heart committed themselves to fully follow. Lord, I pray that this will be their moment. This will be their day. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, beloved. Do you know he's better? Have you said yes to Jesus Christ? Have you looked at the sacrifice he made on the cross and realized that the death he, he offered up there was to forgive your sin, to give you the promise of eternal life, and to give you a hope for this time here? He comes about not by just, just intellectually believing it. It comes by saying... I surrender my all to Jesus. Have you done it? Father, I pray you'll give us the courage to say yes without any res reservation, without any hesitation, as we pray in Jesus' name. Beloved, I'm going to ask you to stand as, as Linda leads us in a song. The altar is here. We invite you to come to pray. Because he's better, he's better, he's better. He's better than any situation you face. He's better than any principle you may be considering. He is better because he is.